Compression is used every day by pretty much anybody who is using a computer. Whether you're loading files off of a CD like a boomer or you're downloading files over the internet or especially whenever you're streaming content from YouTube, Spotify, uh, Twitch or other apps, you are experiencing compressed versions of the original files. But how does this actually work? How does this amazing thing, which saves us so much bandwidth and so much data storage transfer times every day actually work? How are we able to get essentially the same thing, or in some cases, exactly the same thing from a much smaller version of that original thing? Well, to start off, there are two different types of compression that you need to know about. There is lossless and lossy. So lossless compression contains all of the original information of that original file, but it's just going to be arranged in a more efficient way. And it would need to ultimately be run through a decompression algorithm on the receiving computer's end to get that original file back exactly the way it was. Whereas lossy compression is actually sacrificing some information about a file. So in this example that I've got here, the lossless image on the left probably looks pretty much the same way that it would uh, on the raw data that was taken by the camera. Whereas the lossless one, clearly there's some information lost. There's uh, quite a degradation in quality. It's a lot blockier, a lot more pixelated. Uh, and this is basically because You've got pixel areas here that are just being summarized to one or two colors uh, instead of being many different colors like we see on the left hand side. So a lot of information is sacrificed and typically with these lossy compressions, they don't need to be run through decompression on the original machine to rearrange things because they're not just rearranging the data, they're actually removing some data. So lossless encryption or lossless compression rather uh, this is what you would use in the case of downloading really large files like a zip a tar archive or a cab file because uh, you can imagine if this is some code that you need to compile it can't be using a lossy compression if something's actually missing from the code you're going to get an error when you go to compile it um, so essentially what you're doing with this is you're saving bandwidth by transferring a smaller file across the wire at the cost of CPU power to actually open up and do that decompression of the zip or the archive on the receiving machine. Uh, but this makes a lot of sense to do because CPU power is generally much more abundant and much cheaper than network bandwidth, uh, especially when you consider the fact that oftentimes the same file is going to be downloaded over and over and over again. So it just makes sense to serve up a smaller version of it and then let people inflate it on their machines. Uh, so how do you actually go about doing this compression? How do you actually save the information? Well, essentially the compression algorithm is going to look through the file and it's going to create summaries of repeated data uh, amongst a few other things. So the best way to show this would probably be in a text file. Uh, this is actually the text of the first Harry Potter book. So to compress it, there's a few things that we can do. Uh, one, we can just get rid of you know, any blank uh, spaces or any blank lines so that we're not using up uh, any data with that. Um, what we would really wanna do is just create summaries of it. So instead of like, uh, whoops, didn't mean to delete everything there. Uh, instead of having like, you know, three or four or five blank lines here, we might just say like 5x blank or something else that uh, is shorter code for that and then just delete all of those blank lines. Uh, another thing that we'd want to do is, like I said, summarize uh, any repeated data. So this phrase here, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, uh, is very common if we search for it it appears 347 times because basically this appears every time you're technically going to another page. So this shows up a whole lot and it uses a lot of bytes to repeat that every single time. So what I would want to do is delete all occurrences of this and just have it one time up here at the top of the file. Uh, so this is about 40 bytes or so. And then we need to provide some information about where to reinsert the text for that decompression algorithm. So uh, we know that that's going to appear on line 33 
or 32 rather. Uh, and let's see how many characters over it is. So one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll say it's seven characters over. So that's the coordinates for where this date is gonna go. And then you would just repeat that over and over and over again. So like the next occurrence is on 76. And we'll say it's again, 10 over to the right. So we'll say 76, 10. And these coordinates obviously use way less data than writing out this whole phrase. You know, these are using up maybe, well, not even uh, 10 bytes of data, uh, but we'll say 10 just to make it make the math simpler. And this is using roughly 40. So we're saving 30 bytes of data every single time we add another coordinate. So you repeat this process for all of the phrases or words that appear a lot, things like main characters, names, and so on. And suddenly you have a long list of words at the top of the file and their coordinates and then some garbled English at the bottom of just, you know, unique text uh, where those words were removed from. And what you would get is a file that is smaller than the original but it contains everything that the end computer needs to then reassemble the file into a, a sensible work that you can read. The same idea can be applied to pictures. So take this image for example. Uh, this is Windows XP Bliss. This image has probably been seen by more people than any other in history. Think about that for a moment. Uh, it's also a very simple picture because it's really just a big field with some rolling hills and you've got a blue sky background with some white clouds and way off here um, over to the right you've got like some mountains or some other hills that don't really have a lot of information anyway because it's such a small part of the picture it's basically just sort of a bluish grayish uh, clump of pixels so the individual pixels that make up this picture, they've got to be fairly similar, uh, especially in spots like this. In fact, if you made up a list of all of the colors that are used in this entire picture and you wrote out all of their hex values, you might only have a few hundred or a few thousand different colors. So just like how we shortened our text files, uh, we might say that like, you know, this area of blue right here is all the same color. We're going to say it's all one hex value of blue. Uh, and then, you know, this area here is another hex value of blue. Now, this could end up being a lossy compression. Uh, in fact, all of these pixels are not exactly the same color. Like, even if we zoom in where it looks about the same, like, uh, maybe here. This all pretty much looks the same, but once we get in really far, we can see that it isn't exactly the same. Uh, where's my color picker tool? Um, and I need to, so if I go on to this pixel and I open up the color information, so you can see there is some slight variation in the different pixels here, but when you're zoomed out, especially on an image like this, because this is actually a 4K version of Bliss, uh, you can change it and you wouldn't really notice. So like, let's, uh, Let's do this. Let's change. Oh, well, these two right next to each other actually are the same. And this one here, but that's just because it's upscaled. All right, so let's change this. Maybe we'll change that one here, that one here. So you can see it when it's zoomed in a lot, but if we zoom out, naked eye wouldn't really notice that. Now, the more common type of image compression, such as PNG or PNG to JPEG, or uh, especially RAW to JPEG, they're much more intelligent than this, and they produce images that look almost identical. Uh, you're still losing some image data with RAW to JPEG, but what you're mostly losing is metadata, uh, like you know sensor information and all the rest of the XF data that provides information about the camera settings. Uh, that were used during that shot. Now, that's very important if you're going to edit the file, but when you're just exporting it to show it to other people, it makes a lot more sense to have a file that's like five or 10 times smaller uh, with details that most human beings probably won't really notice being gone from a raw uh, compared to a JPEG. 
and PNG to JPEG compression also saves some space, but not as dramatic with RAW to JPEG because what you're mostly doing there is removing transparency and some other layer information. Uh, now lossy compression, it tends to get really aggressive when, with streaming services. So things like Netflix, YouTube, Amazon, uh, they're all able to stream 4K content, which is already really big and at the limits of streaming capability for most places. In fact, some rural places still can't stream 4K at all. Uh, but in order to serve this stream to so many people, very aggressive compression has to happen. And this is why, if you ever looked at a movie that you've seen before, but it's playing on YouTube and you compare it to a rip of the Blu-ray, it's about one-tenth the size or smaller. And you really start to notice a difference when, especially when you play the content on a high-end TV or monitor that has a much wider color range than the standard one. You might even notice fluctuations in the quality depending on the time of day that you're streaming. So generally, when networks are much more congested and everybody is at home streaming, then the quality is going to be lower um, by having the bitrate reduced. And bitrate just refers to the amount of data that is encoded in a given amount of time, usually measured in megabits or kilobits per second. So now you know how compression works. Hope you found this video useful. Have a great day.